western part of the who have joined us now and this very important webinar by a very distinguished professor dr ap jackson of university of cambridge and he is a young cell biologist who is working on ion channels uh, and he is making very seminal contributions in this field so we are all here for to listen to him on a very very important topic of voltage gated sodium uh, sodium ion channels so i welcome all the participants all the viewers from within amity and also the guests from outside amity who have joined us at this webinar and on behalf of founder president dr ashok ke chauhan who has founded this amity universe today which is 11 universities in india and 17 campuses abroad and 28 schools and total number of students is 175000 students and 10000 faculties about 5000 phd scholars and research fellows so it's a huge amity universe and created by dr ashok k chauhan and he himself is a chemist himself and a chemical engineer phd in chemical engineering specialized in polymer technology and he is spearheading the universe and professor jackson we are here to creativity promotion promoting the uh, innovation abilities problem solving abilities resilience to face challenges and also to be a good human being so above all you know, the soft skills as well as behavior and values we are imparting to our students so we want to learn from you from university of oxford who is one of the highly ranked world ranked university and who have churned out many leaders for the whole globe and so we are very proud to have today one very distinguished professor from uh, that university of cambridge and uh, we are also joined by a number of uh, phd scholars research scholars and also our faculties brilliant faculties in within amity as well as we have also invited some guests from outside so i welcome each and every one of you uh, i'll i'll give a little background today uh, we have started in this covid amity is continuing its quality education through online education and also we are promoting research and innovation in all campuses even during this covid situation and we are writing papers publishing papers uh, in good journals like nature uh, science and also the cell uh, material horizon and a number of good journals so there was a thought a very good initiative from our chancellor and the president of the foundation dr atul chauhan and he said why don't we start a global research network on novel viruses today it is corona virus tomorrow it could be something else we keep hearing about nerrs and zika and many many things emerging so why not we start a global network so that we churn all our brain we connect our brains together for synergy and ultimately bringing out novel ideas as on a consortium approach we will work and find solutions to the present and emerging problem so that is how the whole genesis of the network and the professor jackson thank you very much for joining the network and you are the first one who is going to give the webinar from this network itself and so you are making history that way that you was your lecture will be the first webinar which you are doing from the network otherwise we have been organizing thousands of webinars from across the amity universe but this one is unique in the in the sense that from this amity global research network on novel viruses this is the first webinar and uh, now with this preamble i also welcome the panelists i must appreciate my colleagues you know two of them dr somnath pai as well as mishi wasan and the young faculties in amity institute of virology and immunology who have been driving this global network and they have been in contact with you and so today it is because of uh, the man divedi she is from our lucknow campus amity university uttar pradesh lucknow campus 
and he is a brilliant young faculty and who has connected with you and through him this connect came and thank you very much Nish Divedi we will be hearing you also uh, as a panelist subsequently thank you very much and founder president started this Amity Institute of Virology and Immunology more than 10 years ago and knowing that the virology is going to assume a great relevance so he's a really a visionary Dr. Chauhan and he started this and today we have a number of faculties, students who have passed out, and they're all in great institutions. So uh, some of them, they are also interacting with you. So this institute is doing a remarkable job under the leadership of uh, Professor Narayan Rishi, who is the director, the founder, uh, director of that institute. And also he is now spearheading and co as a coordinator for the all activities of Amity Institute of Biology and Immunology. This uh, preamble, I welcome you all for this webinar. And uh, Professor Jackson will be introduced by uh, uh, Dr. Divedi himself. And this topic is very interesting. Because if you see today the whole human physiology, the life starts with the ion channels. You know, the, at the basic cellular the action potential creation is nothing but sodium, potassium, uh, uh, active ion transport across the membrane, cell membrane. And you have other channels like calcium channels. And uh, so those ion channels are the one which gives the whole life. And this electrochemical reaction is taking place and the ion. And the Professor Jackson is working on a very important area, the sodium ion channels. That too, voltage gated sodium ion channels. Because you need the energy voltage gated sodium ion channels. And this plays a very important role in many areas. And he has made seminal contributions in understanding the mutation of this sodium ion channels in inherited epithelial cardiovascular disease, pain syndrome, and many, many areas, including he has noted there's an upregulation of this uh, voltage gated potassium ion, uh, sodium ion channels in cancer and also even in the epilepsy. And he has also uh, tried to use this for early diagnosis of cancer because you have the upregulation of voltage gated sodium ion channels. And he is also working specifically on heart specific voltage gated sodium ion channels and also in chronic pain, what, it, what is its role? So all these areas, he has made the immense contributions in the field. And Professor Jackson, we welcome you, Amis. You are a very, very distinguished person who has made seminal contribution, published papers in JBC, a very important journal, which is very difficult to publish in JBC, the nature, nature group of uh, the uh, journals. And I welcome you with this preamble. I welcome you for this webinar. Now, I would request Dr. Manish. He is a, a faculty, a very a dedicated faculty. He's a DST inspired faculty. There is a Amity University Uttar Pradesh Lucknow campus. And uh, so I would request Dr. Manish. So, uh, can you just briefly introduce? I have mentioned about his work, but over to you to give a formal introduction about Professor Jackson. Okay. Over to you, Dr. Manish Divedi. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, present here. And uh, it's my really, it's my pleasure to introduce our today's guest, uh, Professor A.P. Jackson, uh, to whom I have a contact since long ago. And uh, so, Professor A.P. Jackson is from the University of Cambridge. And uh, here I'm going to welcome Professor Jackson for the inaugural webinar lecture under the Global Research Network on Novel Viruses. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our esteemed speaker today who is going to talk to us about the voltage gated sodium channel and their role in the human health and diseases. And this talk, of course, going to be a very interesting because of uh, the wide range of involvement of these channels in you know, human health and diseases. Professor Jackson is our senior university lecturer in the Department of Biochemistry, University of Cambridge and a teaching fellow at Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. He obtained his doctorate in a clinical biochemistry at Bio Cambridge, clinical biochemistry, 
at Cambridge and carried out postdoctoral research at the Department of Cell Biology, Stanford University. His major, his major research interests are the investigation on structure and function of voltage gated sodium channels, especially the regulatory beta subunits, how the beta subunits are actually correlated with the functioning of sodium uh, channels. And he's also interesting into development of quantitative proximity proteomics methods that can be applied to complex two-dimensional cluster of protein assemblies on the plasma membrane. He has developed a novel method of quantitative proximity math proteomics that is called selective proteomic, proteomics proximity labeling assay using tyramide and as abbreviated as a splat that assists to identify molecular near neighbors of selected plasma membrane proteins. This method has wide application to many problems in the biomolecular sciences. He has published a large number of research articles in a various journal of high repute like Nature Publication Group, JBC, Oxford Journal, etc. And so with this uh, welcome note and with the special excitement, once again, I welcome Professor Jackson to please join us here. And we are really eager to hear you this talk. And I also uh, I know request to all the audience, please copy, uh, keep posting your queries during the session in a question answer box so that I would take all the questions at the last of the talk during the question and answer session. So now I, once again, I welcome Professor Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Manish. Uh, now we are also happy to uh, inform you that for the President, Dr. Ashok Chauhan has joined us also. It is it's a great fortune that he is able to also find time to join us at this webinar. May I now request Honorable Founder President, Dr. Ashok K. Chauhan, to give his initial brief remarks, uh, opening remarks at this webinar. And it is his brainchild to have this webinar as well as the whole network, Committee Global Research Network, under his blessings, Dr. Atul Chauhan has announced this. So over to you, sir. Dr. Ashok K. Chauhan, please. Dr. Salamurti, very well started. I was hearing your comments and your opening remarks. Dr. Manish, you have also very well depicted the worthiness, the experience, and the brilliance of Dr. Jackson. I am very eager, very excited, very pleased on this webinar because that will act as a mind changer for our researchers. So I would say I wish Dr. Jackson my heartiest compliment for sparing his time. I would come back again after hearing all the deliberations. I will manage again come back after hearing all deliberations. I will hear every word. I'm so excited. Thank you very much to all panelists and all participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for joining us. And now may I now request to deliver his webinar on this very important topic, which he has chosen, getting to grips with voltage-gated sodium ion channels in health and disease. Over to you, Dr. Jackson. So thank you very much, everybody, for that uh, very gracious introduction. Uh, I, uh, uh, just to be absolutely clear, can everybody hear me? If, if you can't, then I guess you have to yes. contact Manish or something. But anyway, I'm assuming that everybody can hear me. Yes. So, yes, so thank you very much. It's terrific to be invited and actually be part of the MHC uh, uh, group. Um, I have to say up front, well, first of all, I didn't realize actually that I was going to be the first person to give these talks. So I feel uh, very honored indeed. But also I have to tell you that I'm not going to talk about COVID or viruses. Um, <clears throat> we do have a COVID project actually, but it's just literally been funded uh, this, uh, uh, this, this month and it won't start until September. So I have no data about that. So instead I thought I'd tell you about our ongoing work, the work that we've been involved in in the last ooh, 20 years actually, looking back on it, <clears throat> about the, uh, the sodium channels. And I thought it would be quite um, interesting, I think, because there's a, I know that there's a lot of people, physiologists, electrophysiologists, structural biologists, uh, um, and so on, um, and uh, our work touches on many of those aspects. So that's what uh, I'll talk about. And it's really the voltage-gated sodium channel, particularly the role of uh, a subset of regulators, small regulatory molecules, the beta subunits. 
So um, just in case, just to give you a very basic background, uh, I'm sure most of you probably know this in outline, but it's worth going through the background uh, in some detail so that everybody uh, refreshed uh, and understands uh, where we're coming from. So the voltage-gated sodium channels are critical components of the action potential, and the action potential is the mechanism by which nerves and muscles talk to each other, basically. Um, Bill Catterall, one of the great pioneers in the sodium channel work, uh, once had a review in which he said, every thought that you think depends on voltage-gated sodium channels. I thought that was a terrific way to start a review, but it, and he's right, of course, because all the nerve communications in your brain and your skin and, and the peripheral nerves, all the rest of it, all the contractions of the heart and the muscles depend on voltage-gated sodium channels as part of this action potential. And the action potential uh, involves the sequential opening and closing of sodium channels and potassium channels. And the reason why it can work is because in, in, in eukaryotic cells, and vertebrate cells in particular, there's an imbalance between charges across the plasma membrane. So uh, first of all, can, you, can everybody see this little arrow that I'm tweaking around? Is that, yeah? Okay, so there is um, a higher level of sodium, uh, of, of, of sodium ions outside the membrane compared to inside, and there's a higher level of potassium ions inside than out. Now, as long as the sodium and potassium channels are closed, then there's a barrier, and that difference will be maintained, and that, of course, will generate an electrochemical gradient. When an, uh, an action potential is initiated, and it could typically come from, say, a ligand-gated ion channel, when one nerve uh, activates a neurotransmitter or something, there's a local depolarization in which the, uh, the, m m the membrane potential across the, the, the membrane uh, is depolarized transiently. Now, the voltage-gated sodium channel can sense that change in the membrane potential. And if the membrane potential rises above a threshold, then the sodium channel will open. And because there's more sodium ions on the outside than inside, you'll get this rush of sodium ions into the cell. And that will depolarize the membrane further. So you get this sort of positive feedback effect. And that's what gives you this upswing in the action potential, the depolarizing phase. However, within a few milliseconds, the sodium channel goes, undergoes a conformational change. What happens is that the channel becomes what's called inactive. That is to say there's a cytoplasmic tail in the channel, which uh, latches onto what we now know to be an allosteric site, and that generates the inactive state. Now, the inactive state is not the same as the closed state. The inactive state cannot, cannot respond to any further depolarizations that occur upstream. And therefore, it means that the action potential can only be propagated in one direction, because upstream of that, the channels are transiently uh, non-responsive. However, within a few milliseconds again, the channel resets and it goes back to the closed state. And when it's back in the closed state, it can then respond to a further depolarization signal. Now, the potassium channels, meanwhile, are opening. They open with a slightly later kinetics so that as the sodium channels close, the potassium channels open. And because there's more potassium inside than out, the potassium channels, when they open, the potassium ions move outward and that then restores the membrane potential. And that's what gives you this burst, this spike of activity. And because there is this uh, directionality, because of the way the channels go from open, inactive, closed, and so on, it means that there is a depolarizing wave which moves along the membrane in one direction. I got this really neat little GIF, which I found somewhere, which shows you the, uh, how the channel, uh, how the action potential works. So that gives you an idea of how this thing works. And actually the sodium channel and potassium channel together work uh, to generate the action potential. And in some cases like the heart, for example, there are calcium channels as well, and they open in response to these transient changes in membrane potential. And that burst of calcium into the cell then activates muscle contraction, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the core idea underlying the action potential. And to get 
more sophisticated ideas, we have to start thinking in quantitative terms about these, uh, how these changes occur. Because uh, not only will the channels respond over certain voltage ranges, but they will do so with certain kinetics. So for example, the rate at which the channel opens and the voltage range over which the channel opens and the voltage range over which the channel inactivates and the rate at which the channel resets from the inactive state back to the closed state, all of these parameters in theory could be changed. And uh, indeed, there are, t uh, uh, there are lots of different sodium channels and they all have slightly different gating and kinetic properties expressed in different tissue specific forms presumably tailored uh, to their physiological uh, requirements. Now, that's, all of that was worked out by electrophysiologists and biochemists, biophysicists over a 40-year period and uh, without knowing anything much about the actual structure. But in the last few years, we've been had the opportunity to start looking at sodium channels in greater atomic, near atomic resolution structure. And the revolution has been really due to the development of cryo-electron microscopy, people like Richard Henderson and so on, who uh, works in Cambridge, got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for this work, has really opened up this field. So now we can start to look at sodium channels and other membrane proteins in near atomic uh, resolution. And uh, if you look at the, the structure in, in reviews on sodium channels, you often see a diagram, a cartoon that looks like this. And uh, the idea is that the, the primary sequence, when you look at the primary sequence of the sodium channel, you can clearly see that there are four internally homologous domains. It's a single polypeptide chain of about 250 kilodaltons, but the sequences clearly show that there are four internally homologous domains. And these are called D1, D2, D3, and D4. And each of these domains has six transmembrane alpha helices, S1 to S6. And there are extracellular loop regions connecting those helices, and there are intracellular loop regions connecting them as well. The so-called S5 and S6 here are particularly important because if you s notice, the, there's a, a region which goes up and then it comes back down again into the channel and out again. That's what's called the reentrant pore, and that forms part of the components of the actual sodium channel uh, ion pore itself. I'm not going to go into that in, in, in too much detail, but if you read reviews on the sodium channel, they will mention this. Anyway, so that only takes us a little bit further because we really like to know how all of this thing folds up in three dimensions. And notice, by the way, that the fourth helix in each of these has a very interesting sequence. It's got a run of arginines and lysines. So every fourth helix, S4 of domain one, two, three, and four, has this run of positively charged uh, uh, residues, and they're all uh, every third and fourth amino acid. So in other words, one face of that helix will be positively charged. And that's what's called the voltage sensor. And that's the part of the molecule that responds to, senses changes in the membrane potential. And somehow the movement of that helix in response to changes in membrane potential will kickstart a whole set of conformational changes which ultimately lead to the opening of the channel. But again, until we actually look at the structure, we can't really say much just by looking at the primary sequence. And that's why the cryo-EN structures that are coming out now, mainly from Ning Yang's group uh, in Beijing and now in Princeton, uh, has really revolutionized the field. Anyway, so here is a sort of generic sodium channel to give you an idea. And I've colored the domains uh, differently so you can see where they are. So in this case, we're looking from the top down and from this case, we're looking at the side view and there's the membrane, the lipids of the membrane. And you can see how the four alpha helices of these, these four form this lobe here around the outside. And then helix five and six form this inner uh, 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 region. And the S4 helix, the voltage sensor, is found here in the outer uh, of domain. <clears throat> and 
so it's the movement of that helix in response to changes in membrane potential uh, that uh, uh, drives the conformational change. And when you actually look, it's, I, I would recommend that you actually dig out the cryo-EM structures in Pymol and play around with it yourself. But you can see how there's a helix here, which is flat against the membrane, and that's connected to helix four. And so when helix four moves, that thing moves a little bit, and that induces a twist, which opens up this region, which is the pore. And it's like an iris. It opens in a twisting motion. And that's the pore, and that's where the sodium ion moves. And so the, that's the opening of the channel. The inactivation occurs a few milliseconds later when this intracellular region called the inactivation gate binds to an allosteric site in the intracellular region, and that blocks the chat, the pore, but it's not in a, but, but so it cannot um, allow further sodium ions to move, but again, it needs to re be reset to go back to the uh, closed state. So now we're beginning to look at structures uh, in atomic resolution to give us insights into how this thing actually works. Now, having said all of that, it turns out that the sodium channel itself is very rarely just this subunit, the alpha subunit. Most sodium channels phys in physiological states have associated with them various regulatory molecules. One of the most important are the so-called beta subunits. Now, the beta subunits are relatively simple structures compared to the alpha. So they only have a single alpha helical transmembrane domain. They've got a C-terminal, fairly flexible, uh, disordered region, uh, a, a flexible extended neck here, and then on the extracellular face, a single immunoglobulin domain. And that's interesting because, of course, the immunoglobulin domain is typically associated with antibodies and cell adhesion molecules and so on. We, we don't expect it to be part of sodium channel. But it turns out, in fact, that when you do the phylogeny, you can see that the sodium channels cluster together with these other uh, cell adhesion molecule families. And then there is, in fact, no doubt that the beta subunits are cell adhesion molecules in their own right. Other work from Laurie Eisen's group in particular has shown that, that some of these beta subunits definitely are trans cell adhesion molecules, as well as sodium channel regulators. So anyway, the crystal structure now of all of the betas has been resolved. We um, discovered the beta-3 subunit some time ago, and we published the crystal structure of the Ig domain of beta-3 some uh, few years ago. Um, and uh, uh, they are all very similar in outline. They all have a classical immunoglobulin structure, that is to say, beta sandwich connected by a disulfide bond. Although beta-2 and beta-4 are more closely related to each other than beta-1 and beta-3. So the beta-3 subunit, if you look at its phylogeny, it's closest to the beta-1 subunit in terms of structure. And the beta-4 and beta-2 are more similar to each other than they are to the beta-1 beta and beta-3. Now, the cryo-EM structure, this is the cryo-EM structure of NAV 1.7, which is a sodium channel I'll be talking about in some detail later on. But this is one of the first sodium channels where we had a good resolution of two of the uh, beta subunits. And uh, this is the beta-1 subunit. And where's the Ig domain? And there's the transmembrane alpha helix. And then the beta-2 subunit, and we think the beta-4 is binding at the same site too. Now, the way this is uh, it, it, drawn, it looks like it's sort of floating there. Um, it turns out that the beta-2 and the beta-4 are disulfide bonded to the sodium channel because they have a, a free cysteine. And that's presumably why they're held together strongly and covalently. The transmembrane domain in this structure has not been resolved, which suggests that by the time you pull this thing out of the membrane and do the cryo-EM, uh, this uh, transmembrane domain is not tightly associated. The transmembrane domain of the beta-1 is bound very tightly and you can resolve it. The C-terminal, interestingly enough, is not resolved and neither is the C-terminus of the alpha subunit in these cryo-EM structures. So we think that this cryo-EM structure is looking at one particular conformational state for various reasons, we think it's most likely to approximate the inactive state. Uh, and under those circumstances, then, the C-terminal 
domain of the alpha and the C-terminal domain of the beta-1 don't seem to be resolved, even though we know from other work that those two uh, C-terminal regions can interact. Anyway, so that's the best structure we have for an alpha-beta pair. But as I said, we're particularly interested in the beta-3 subunit, uh, and unfortunately, uh, we don't yet know where the B3 binds, okay? And uh, so that's one of the th major things that I'm interested in developing and, and looking at. Looking at the structure and the conservation of structure, as I mentioned, it's B3 is most similar to B1. And therefore, there is a good educated guess would be that beta-3 might well be binding to a site very similar to, if not identical to the beta-1 site, but we don't know that yet for sure. Anyway, so the reason why I'm particularly interested in the beta-3 is because it turns out that the beta-3 is a very important regulator of at least two very important sodium channels. And the first one I want to talk about is NAV 1.7, which I've already introduced in terms of the structure that came out a couple of, uh, last year from Ning Yang's group. Now NAV 1.7 is a, a sodium channel which is expressed in peripheral ner neurons of the dorsal root ganglia and in fact they're specifically expressed in the DRG C fiber neurons which are involved in pain perception. There's a lot of good evidence that NAV 1.7 plays a very important role in pain perception and uh, the evidence for example is that uh, there are some very rare individuals who literally cannot feel pain. And they have mutations, inactivating mutations in NAV 1.7. Now you might think actually a world without pain would be quite attractive, but actually it isn't. Pain has a very important biological function. It warns us when damaging things are happening to our bodies and it motivates us to get out of the way quickly. And the problem that these people, these patients, Face is that they don't realize they're doing damaging things to their body. So they put their hand on a hot plate or something, or they, they, uh, or they, they break a, a bone or something, and they don't, literally they don't realize it. Um, I actually met one of these women once, and she told me that um, when she was a little girl, she used to jump off the roof of, her, of the, of the uh, garage onto a concrete floor. She thought this was kind of fun. And she did this, she kept doing this and kept doing this, and eventually she broke her kneecap. But she didn't realize that she'd broken her kneecap until about a week later when it became seriously infected. Um, and uh, so that's what happens to these people all the time. But the fact that they exist and the fact that they have this very precise uh, pathology, everything else, by the way, about these individuals is normal. They develop normally, they have normal IQs and all the rest of it. And that tells you that NAV 1.7 is very specific for pain perception. And therefore, there's a lot of interest now in developing drugs that could target NAV 1.7 as a treatment for chronic pain. Now, the beta-3 subunit is also highly expressed with NAV 1.7 in these DRG neurons. Now, we generated a beta-3 knockout mouse uh, some time ago, and oh, we haven't published this yet, uh, but it turns out that they have a subtle pain defect. So they're not like the patients who can't feel pain, it's just that they're less sensitive uh, to pain. So in other words, beta-3 is regulating NAV 1.7, it's fine-tuning the gating um, uh, to the point where uh, it definitely affects uh, the perception of pain. And so what we've been doing is we've look, been looking in more detail at this. Um, we've started with a stable cell line that John Wood's group in London gave us, and we've made a stable uh, cell line from that, which is also expressing the beta-3 subunit. Now these are just electrophysiology type experiments and they can tell you that the, what's called the peak current, so that's basically a measure of how much channel is in the membrane, uh, increases in the presence of the beta. And in fact the betas are probably, as well as regulators, they're probably uh, sort of chaperones as well because they help fold the proteins in the ER. But they also shift the voltage range over which the channels uh, inactivate. And the reason why that's important is the resting membrane potential in a neuron is down here somewhere. So if, if, there, was, uh, if there was no beta subunit, then about 50 or 60% of the channels would be inactive, which means that that would 
those would the forty percent in uh, uh, sorry the the forty percent inactive uh, would not be available uh, uh, to open and close, and therefore the sensitivity of the channel would be compromised. However, when the betas bind, they shift this curve over to the right, which means that at that resting potential, now a hundred percent of the channel uh, is uh, 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 can can respond. So. Um, and again, that's consistent actually with this subtle pain phenotype I mentioned earlier. So we think that that's important. But, and, but, and the other thing that's interesting is that the activation does not seem to be affected. Now, the reason why that's important is that the four different subunits of the channel are specialized. So the movement of S4 in D1, D2, and D3 are involved in the opening of the channel, the activation. Whereas the movement of S4 in D4, the D4 domain, is, is, initiates the inactivation process. And the rate at which this S4 moves in D4 is slightly slower than the movement of S4 in D1, D2, and D3. So in other words, the channel's open very quickly, and then within a few milliseconds, the S4 and D4 moves, and that inactivates the channel. So the D4 region is involved in inactivation. The D1, 2, and 3 are in activation. So that suggests to us that the beta 3 subunit is probably somewhere around D4 somewhere. And uh, we've been using a number of different uh, approaches to get a tighter uh, uh, resolution on this. And one of them that we've been using is the use of single chain antibodies. Now, this is a technology which uh, has been developed recent, well, I guess in the last 10 years or so, um, and um, allows you to make monoclonal antibody structures, but without using any mice or animals and so on. You do it a lot faster. So the whole thing has now been moved from the animal into E. coli, into an in vitro, in, in vitro assay. Basically, you take the cDNA for a, a, an antibody variable region. So not the whole, this is the whole antibody, the IgG, which has all of these different domains. But what we can do is we can just cut out the single variable region domain from the fab fragment. So it's not even a fab fragment. And then we can express it in E. coli, and the antigen binding sites, the variable and the hypervariable regions, can all be randomized to generate a library of uh, 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 randomized uh, single chain antibodies. And then you can express that in E. coli, and actually the way you would normally do it is that you would express it as a, 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 on a, an M13 type uh, phage for convenience. And that allows you then to screen particular antigens of interest or particular proteins or particular fragments of proteins. So we've been using this approach to generate single chain antibodies to the beta subunits and also to the sodium channel alpha subunits where we think the beta 3 Ig domain should bind. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry. And this is just to give you a, an overview of the sort of results that we, we would get here. So for example, uh, we've made a, a peptide corresponding to that extracellular loop region, which from the, from the state of beta one uh, should be uh, part of the uh, beta one binding, uh, the, the beta one binding site. So if beta three is binding here, then we should be able to get antibodies to this region that might be interfered with by the binding of the beta three. And this is just a summary of the ELISA type assay that we would get in our screening assay. So we would take a protein or a peptide corresponding to that, absorb it onto a plastic and take this, the whole library, which is this thing, and then uh, put the N13 phage on them, pull them out, reclone them uh, uh, and see what we get. And by that a process, which it takes a few weeks, but it compared to making traditional ways of making an antibody, it's quite a, a fast process. And you can see already that we've got several uh, good hits uh, there. So um, the problem, of course, is that we were ended up with single chain antibodies to these fragments and peptides, and they may or may not bind to the whole channel in vivo. So 
to, to what, having done this first screen, we then take them and do a secondary screen against the sodium channels in whole cells. And to do this, we're exploiting uh, a, a technique uh, which uh, allows you to measure cell binding to a particular molecule um, by measuring the impedance uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, wells of a 96 well plate. Uh, the commercial co uh, name for this is the Acceligence system. I think there are other ways of uh, uh, machines as well. Anyway, this is the one that we use. And uh, basically you have a 96 well plate and each well has these little electrodes so that there would naturally be a current moving between them. If you put a cell in and it binds very tightly, then that will interfere with the electric field and that can be detected as an increase in impedance. So what we've done is we've put the single chain antibodies to our sodium channels on, this, on these wells and then simply add the cells expressing sodium channels onto them. And if we get an increased binding, then we can detect that by the change in impedance. And this is the sort of thing that we get. Now, this is uh, one example just to show you what we can do. So this happens to be a single chain antibody that we made against uh, a re the, the, uh, one of the regions where we thought the beta three IG domain might be binding. What you can see here is there's the, the binding to, of the uh, wild type hex cells. So these are hex cells without any sodium channels. And then this is the binding of hex cells uh, which are expressing, stably expressing 1.7, that's the blue line. And then the hex cells expressing 1.7 and beta 3 have essentially the same uh, uh, binding. So that particular antibody is recognizing an epitope. And remember, these are single chain antibodies, so they're monoclonal antibodies. They will only recognize single epitopes. The epitope that this antibody is recognizing is we, we infer exposed in both the 1.7 cells and the 1.7 beta 3 cells. However, this is uh, another uh, antibody, C19. Now I have to uh, uh, apologize because I, when I was putting this together, I, I realized that the colors were different. So I'm sorry about that, uh, but you just uh, bear with me. But anyway, the bottom line is this is another single chain antibody, which again is to, uh, was raised to the same uh, peptide region. But this time it has a different binding behavior. So this time the uh, cells, the hex cells with 1.7 bind quite nicely, whereas the hex cells with beta 3, 1.7 and beta 3, uh, bind uh, just, uh, just as the control does. So we think that this antibody is recognizing an epitope which may be hidden by, which is present in 1.7, but may be hidden by the presence of the beta 3. What we haven't done yet, this is an ongoing piece of work by a graduate student of mine, what we would like to do next and what we will do next is to take the peptide, fairly large peptide that we use to screen and then start to cut that down and identify the epitope. And we can do that in one of several ways. We could do fragmentation or we could even do things like a deuterium exchange. We've got a collaborators at Medimmune uh, who can do that rather specialist uh, job for us and they will um, ide hopefully identify the epitope uh, pre more precisely. And once we've done that, we can then map that onto the cryo-EM structure and, and hopefully we'll find that these two antibodies bind different epitopes and one of them will uh, presumably, uh, we hope, will uh, be a part of the beta-3 Ig domain binding site. That's the hope anyway. Um, the other a strategy that we're using is uh, to uh, use some other natural proteins that bind to sodium channels. Now, this is a, a major area of research actually within pharmacology, because remember I said that there's a lot of interest in um, developing drugs that can target NAV 1.7. Because if we did get that, it would be a very, it could potentially be very useful in the treatment of pain. And uh, unfortunately, it turns out that this is very difficult because uh, the, all of the different sodium channels are very similar to each other in terms of structure. And uh, if you get a small molecule that binds to a NAV 1.7, um, it's almost always the case that it will bind to some of these other sodium channels as well. However, nature might have done us a, a, a favor because, um, because the sodium channels are so important functionally, 
um, a lot of these sodium channels have become a target for many different uh, uh, animals uh, and uh, that uh, are, are involved that, that either are, are, have chemical defenses or uh, are hunters that use venom. Um, so spider and scorpion venom contain protein peptides that often bind with quite high specificity to various sodium channels. And uh, we've been looking at two, one of which is the so-called protoxin 2, and this is produced by the tarantula spider. Um, and uh, the protoxin 2 binds to sodium channels, including NAV 1.7, and inhibits the sodium channel. And again, that would make sense because the sodium channel being critical to muscle contraction and all of these other things, if you paralyze it, if you inhibit it, then the prey will be paralyzed. That's the idea, I think, behind it. So uh, we've been looking at that because what we were interested in was uh, to see whether the beta-3 subunit would affect the binding and the gating kinetics uh, and the inhibition of this toxin. If it does, then perhaps we could say something about whether the beta-3 is binding close to where these toxins bind. The binding sites of these toxins are already known. So that's one toxin we've been looking at. And the other toxin we've been looking at is called OD1, and it's from uh, this sand scorpion. Now, OD1 has a, a different uh, property and a very interesting one, which probably um, doesn't make it a very useful tool in terms of therapy, but it's still an, an interesting from uh, a functional uh, point of view. Because OD1 has the opposite effect. OD1 binds to NAV 1.7 and it stimulates it but it's very specific for 1.7. Now the consequence of that is that if you get bitten by this scorpion, it will be very painful. And we suspect that the reason the scorpion has this venom is actually as a defense mechanism. Because if you're a scorpion, you're still a quite a small little creature compared to some of the other big things that might want to eat you. So having a venom, which not only you can use to catch a small prey, but also defend you against bigger uh, prey uh, could be very useful. So OD1, although it's not a very useful therapy, it might still be a very useful molecule to probe uh, the structure function studies. So we've been looking at that in terms of the, uh, how the beta-3 affects NAV 1.7. And as I said, we know where the toxins bind. So D2 binds to, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, Protox 2 the, from, the, uh, uh, from the tarantula binds to the domain 2 region and actually very close to the voltage center and it probably stops it from moving which is why it locks it and inhibits it. The OD1 binds to D4 and remember I said D4 was involved in inactivation and that's interesting because that suggests that D4 is affecting the inactivation pathway not the activation. And in fact that turns out to be correct because what's ha what we found is that uh, the uh, protox in does indeed inhibit NAV 1.7 activity. And actually the presence of the beta-3, although the beta-3 increases the peak current, the relative proportional decrease in the presence of protoxin is the same. In other words, the protoxin is inhibiting both 1.7 and 1.7 beta-3. However, the OD1, on the other hand, is not being inhibited in terms of its activation uh, by, uh, 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 and the, again, the beta-3 does not uh, affect uh, the, uh, the activation or changes in the activation profile. On the other hand though, OD1 has a very interesting effect on inactivation in that it shifts the voltage range over which the channel inactivates uh, back to the leftward direction, but only if beta-3 is not present. Now, this is a bit complicated to explain, and we could go into this in more detail in, in, uh, in, um, in the discussion afterwards, but the bottom line is that the, if you notice, there's a region here where a uh, set of voltages here, where in theory you could have a channel which was open, but also a channel that was not quite closed or cl not quite inactive. That's a so, that would generate what's called a window current. And window currents are generally not good because they, uh, they, 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 they generate uh, self-sustaining um, 
feedback uh, uh, effects and you get sort of hyper stimulation and so on. And what the effect of the toxin has because of the way it shifts the voltage range over which the inactivation works is that it's changing the, the, the window current into a more physiological range and the bottom and, and, and the effect would therefore be to make this channel more sensitive but only if it's got 1.7 present. That suggests that 1.7 is uh, and the OD1 is binding to a site to, to very close by sites but also the OD1 has been fine-tuned to target specifically 1.7 beta 3, not just 1.7. And then there's one final uh, thing that OD1 does, which is interesting, because remember, as well as the voltage range over which the channels open and close, there's a kinetic aspect to this. It, uh, the kinetic, the rates at which the channels open, and the rates at which they inactivate, and the rates at which they recover from inactivation, all of these can be changed. And what OD1 does as well as these effects on steady state gating is that it speeds up the recovery from inactivation. So this bit is accelerated, which means that the channel is set, is reset faster, which means that it can fire again. And the combination of both of these effects will end up with a situation where the channel is firing too fast, basically. And that's probably why it acts as an activator and why when you get stung by this scorpion, it's very painful. Okay. Anyway, so, but, but, the, but the important point is that because OD1 is affecting inactivation, it suggests, and we know that it binds here, which is involved in inactivation, it suggests that beta three is going to be binding here somewhere close by. And that's also consistent with some structural work that we've done. Remember I said that the C-terminal region of the alpha subunit and the C-terminal region of the beta subunit here is not resolved in the cryostructure. But we do know from other work that the C-terminus of beta-3 can bind to this C-terminus of NAB 1.7 and therefore they must be close enough for that, that interaction to occur. When you do the geometry and, the, and, and, and so on, uh, and you plot it all out, then actually that's consistent with the beta-3 subunit being very close to the beta-1 binding site. So the combination of the work that we've done with this OD1 plus the single chain antibody work, although it's still provisional, suggests to us that the beta-3 and beta-1 binding sites are going to be very similar. Um, now, the beta subunits, I mentioned that the beta subunits are cell adhesion molecules. And uh, it turns out that there are some tissues where the beta subunits are expressed, but the alpha subunits are not. In other words, the beta subunits probably have in roles on their own without uh, interacting with the alpha subunits. And uh, in fact, uh, when we did the cr uh, crystal structure, this is X-ray crystallography, but not cryo-EM, when we did the crystal structure of the Ig domain of beta-3, um, the unit cell had a, a trimeric structure uh, with a very strongly conserved region forming this trimer interface. Now we were initially um, worried that this might be a crystal packing artifact, um, but it turns out that it's almost certainly isn't because A, uh, when we did super resolution imaging, we could show that on the surface of cells that are transfected alone, then you get trimers, uh, and also by boom cross-linking, um, uh, we, we can show that we can get monomers, dimers, and trimers cross-linked uh, in vivo. And uh, we have other pieces of evidence as well. We've got proximity ligation assay evidence as well, uh, which is uh, in this paper, which I haven't got time to go into. But taken together, uh, we think that actually, at least under some conditions, the beta-3 subunit, if you express it on its own without any alpha, will bind uh, to each other and form these trimers. Now the paradox is that this trimer interface is actually similar to the binding site for uh, the Ig domain on on the beta uh, on NAV 1.7. So it's an interesting possibility that in the absence of 1.7 the beta 3 will form these trimers but in the presence of beta-3, it will tend to form one-to-one -one complexes 
with NAV 1.7 and be incapable of forming a trimer. That's a hypothesis that we're working on at the moment. So that's 1.7. I also want to talk about NAV 1.5, which is the alpha subunit, which is expressed in the heart. And again, the beta-3 subunit is a powerful physiological regulator of NAV 1.7. Uh, we know that for ver from various reasons. We, we can immunoprecipitate 1.5 and beta-3. We can uh, show uh, that uh, the, in the beta-3 knockout mouse, the mouse develops normally, except that it has these spontaneous cardiac arrhythmias, which are actually quite similar to a, an inherited human condition called Brugada syndrome. And lo and behold, it turns out that there are some people with Brugada syndrome who have mutations in the beta-3. Uh, so for all of these reasons, uh, we were very interested in how the beta-3 can fine tune 1.5 as well. Um, so the 1.5 is expressed on the surface of these cardiomyocytes. Cardiomyocytes are in interesting, they're muscle fibers, but they form these connected tubes, fibers, in which each of these is a cell, and these are connected by what's called the intercalated disks. An intercalated disk contain these connexin molecules which form uh, an electrical connection effectively between cells. Um, so that, for example, when the sodium channel opens on one cell and you get a sodium in, uh, in increase of sodium ions uh, during the action potential, the sodium ions can then actually pass across through the connexins uh, to activate the next uh, cell in, in the sequence. Um, but, so, okay, so 1.5 and beta-3 interact. And indeed, when we did the electrophys, we find a very similar pattern with 1.5 compared to 1.7. That is to say, there's no effect on the activation, steady state activation, but you have the same effect on inactivation. So, again, consistent with it essentially behaving in the same way as NAV 1.7. How, and indeed, when you look at the structure of NAV 1.7 and the cryo-EM structure of 1.5, they are in fact very similar. You can stick them together. Uh, they, uh, uh, they're very closely uh, meshed together. And yet, we th when you look more closely, there is a subtle but I think very interesting and I think very significant difference. And it's precisely in that region of the alpha subunit where we think the beta one stroke beta three Ig domain is binding. Because it turns out that, so here's the cryo -EM structure of 1.7 and that's the beta one Ig domain. And there's this residue here, it's the glutamic acid in 1.7. And in fact, that glutamic acid is found in all of the sodium channels except 1.5. In 1.5, it's changed to an asparagine. It's not quite the same residue because there are inserts and deletions between them, but essentially that is the same position. And not only is that moved from a negatively charged to a neutral amino acid, but of course it's actually in an N-link glycosylation site. And not only that, but there's a great dollop of electron density sitting right there, which we now know to be N-link sugars. And remember that in the cryo-EM structure, you can only resolve a couple of the sugar residues. The actual real structure, the actual real um, N-leak sugar is much bigger than that, but you can't resolve it because they're all flopping around. In other words, there's a great big dollop of sugar sitting here, right where we think the Ig domain should be binding. And the consequence of that is that there isn't any real way in which the beta one Ig domain, or indeed the beta-3 Ig domain, will be able to bind to that site in the way that it does for beta-1. And that, I think, is very significant. Because even if the transmembrane domain binds at the same site, it implies that the Ig domains will be outward or flopping around. And given what we showed about how the Ig domains can form these dimers and trimers via a region which would normally be part of the alpha subunit binding site, we suspect that maybe what's going on is that the beta-3 is there to cross-link the NAV 1.5 sodium channels together on the surface. It's been known for a long time that NAV 1.5 on the surface of the plasma membrane and in the intercalated disk does indeed form these two-dimensional clusters. Uh, and indeed, we did some uh, super-resolution imaging uh, analysis 
Um, and it turns out that it's a bit more subtle than I was expecting because it turns out that NAV 1.5 on its own does indeed cluster. But the presence of the beta 3 changes the geometry of the cluster, changes the relative orientation of the channels on the plasma membrane. And it's a subtle effect. This is nearest neighbor analysis and these are the cluster radii, but they are highly significant differences. The problem, of course, is that we don't yet understand the functional implication of this. Neither, in fact, do we know much more about the actual structure because, of course, super resolution imaging can only get you so far. What we would really like to be able to do is to get down uh, to, um, you know, tens of nanometers resolution on the surface of the plasma membrane and then see the individual channels because then we would be able to map the individual position of individual channels and their relative positions relative to each other within a cluster. Anyway, finally, um, I'll just mention one other piece of work that we're doing, um, and that is, uh, uh, as, as you brought up actually in the introduction, the uh, relationship between sodium channels and cancer. Now, this is a very surprising result because most uh, cancers uh, are not in you know, electrically excitable cells and tissues. Um, however, it has been known for some time that things like breast cancer, for example, breast, tube, breast cancer cells often express sodium channels. And uh, in particular, they ex actually express NAV 1.7, which is interesting in its own right. Um, and uh, not only that, but if you put specific inhibitors of the NAV 1.7 onto the cells, you, you don't kill the cells. What you do is you slow down their, the rate at which they can crawl through a substratum. In other words, their metastatic potential is affected, which is interesting. Why that should be is a very interesting question, which I don't know the answer to. It's possible that the cancer cell is using the sodium channel in a completely different function to its normal role in activating uh, in action potentials because I don't think breast cancers fire action potentials, right? Anyway, so um, given that we were all locked down for two, three months, um, my graduate student who found himself stuck in his, his flat in London during the lockdown, I said, well, you know what you could do is you could start looking through some of the open source databases to see whether or not any of the sodium channels are known to be expressed in various tumors. Uh, and what he discovered was actually quite interesting because it turns out that the beta-3 subunit the gene for beta-3 is encoded by the SCM3 bean gene. The beta-3 gene uh, is, or the beta-3 is significantly upregulated in this set of cancers, which are the pheochromocytomas and the paragangliomas. And those are relatively rare tumors. They're often relatively benign. Well, they can be malignant. They're often benign, but nevertheless, they are uh, dangerous tumors and they're relatively rare. Uh, so there aren't that many good markers uh, for pheochromocytomas. Um, so that's actually quite interesting. So why there's an upregulation of beta-3 specifically in these uh, pheochromocytomas, I don't know. But it's an interesting observation. And in fact, when again, when he looked at some of the other open source databases, and again, this is a different database, and he basically got the same answer, that's good. That means that we are pretty confident that beta-3 is indeed upregulated in these pheochromocytomas. We're now looking at pheochromocytomas and all the other sodium channels, and there are a couple of others that are particularly interested. So the SCN9A, which is the NAB 1.7 protein, I'm afraid the nomenclature is a bit weird, but uh, again, what we find is uh, that uh, there is a significant increase in in NAV 1.7 in these tumors, but, but the, the, the beta-3 in particular looks very promising. So given that we are making these single chain antibodies and we're using them for functional studies initially and structural studies initially, but of course a single chain antibody is a monoclonal antibody. And of course it can be used as the basis of an ELISA type assay or a clinical assay. So one of the things that we will be doing when we get back in the lab we have, uh, we're collaborating with a group at the endocrine uh, unit at Adam Brooks Hospital at Cambridge, who have access to patient samples from, uh, with pheochromocytomas. And so we'll be testing whether or not our single chain antibodies, both to 1.7 
and to the beta-3 subunit that we've been making uh, will be of some use as diagnostic markers in the first instance uh, to see whether or not uh, we can use that as a diagnostic test for fear from cytoma. If, if, if indeed that works, then of course we could in principle also use these as a way of targeting the tumours because uh, it's uh, a well-established technique now to take to a toxin or something or radioactive isotope or something and put them on an antibody and target it to cancers that way. So that's another aspect of our work uh, that we've uh, just started to do and hopefully in the next year when we get back to the lab we can start to flesh that out. So in summary, these sodium channels are major pharmacological targets and they're implicated in many different diseases. I haven't had time to go into all the inherited diseases that are uh, where mutations and sodium channels are affected. I mentioned the congenital insensitive to, to pain. I mentioned Brigada syndrome. There are inherited forms of epilepsy, muscle myotonia, and so on, uh, again, associated with different sodium channels. And uh, there's a huge interest in sodium channels as drug targets for all of that reason. And now the cryo-EM structures are coming out. We can start to sharpen up our structural hypotheses and functional hypotheses if you like. We can see which bits of the channel are moving, we can map the mutants onto them and so on, and we can map on these beta subunits. Um, we're particularly interested in the beta-3 because of its effects on NAV1.7 and NAV1.5. Um, we don't yet know the location of the beta-3 on NAV1.7 and 1.5. We suspect that they're very it's very similar to the beta-1. We also suspect, for reasons I explained, the beta-3 will bind in a slightly different way to NAV1.5 compared to 1.7. Um, and then an, another uh, major area of work will be to see whether or not <coughs> the uh, clusters um, uh, can be uh, the re the resolved uh, better, the actual organization of the channels within these clusters. And then finally, uh, a new thing that's opened up in the last six months or so is this whole business of sodium channels as markers uh, for cancer. So uh, I just want to say thank you to a whole bunch of people. Um, Samantha Salvage, Joe Reese, Samir, Hamea are all postdocs in the lab. Sam did a lot of the electrophys on the 1.5 and the 1.7 and toxins. Samir did a lot of work on the uh, single chain antibodies and Joe Reese did uh, a lot of the work on some of the cell biology and structural biology. Um, Tafik uh, Rahman in the Department of Pharmacology collaborates with us. He's a very uh, he's a very good structural modeler and he's been helping us doing uh, modeling the toxin binding sites and so on. Uh, Henry Liu is a new graduate student. Jennifer Irons, Hannes Coley, a grad student. I forgot this, uh, I should also say, uh, 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 Siva Kumar Namadurai uh, did the uh, x-ray structure of, uh, of the beta-3. Uh, and then finally, Chris Wang is a collaborator of ours in the Department of Physiology. He's a cardiovascular biologist uh, has, and, and has enormous experience of the heart and the heart physiology. Um, then uh, these guys at Harwell helped us with the super resolution imaging. Jonathan Silver and Wandi Zhu in Washington University helped, uh, did some collaboration with us uh, on uh, some of the electrophys work that we published in JBC earlier this year. And then Glenn King and David Eagles in uh, Australia, University of Queensland, um, they've made major um, contributions to the whole study of venom toxins uh, and they were able to supply us with the, uh, the appropriate venom toxins. And then these are the people who have funded our work over the years. So thank you very much. I hope that that was, um, I hope that you could uh, uh, follow that and I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, answer any more questions. And I should also say, by the way, um, that uh, I'd be welcome to email me uh, with any further questions if you have any after this talk, because it's usually the case that you know, you go to this talk and you and you can't think of a question, and then the minute you everybody goes away, you think, "Oh, I had this really useful question." So please, uh, I'm happy to uh, to take any email questions as well. Okay. Okay. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much for such an informative and elaborative uh, information on sodium channels and their environment. You know. Uh, pain and uh, you know uh, heart cells as also in you know, a cancer somehow.
So now uh, we'll go for uh, some questions. Uh, due to the time constraint, we'll take only a few questions from the audience and then we'll go for another, another um, you know, talk or another session. So there's a one question uh, uh, from Suparna. There's a, uh, he, she's asking that uh, is, is the involved stoichiometry or geometry of the sodium channels known? I mean, what stoichiometry the four alpha subunit form when the sodium channels are at work? So maybe oh. she's, yeah. Yeah, so the, if we just go back to, interesting. Let's go all the way back to the, so the, um, as I mentioned, this is a single polypeptide chain, but it has these four internally homologous domains, and this is a single polypeptide chain, okay? But it's a very big protein, it's 250 kilodaltons, but it folds up in this, uh, uh, this structure with a fourfold pseudo symmetry. These are not literally identical because there are different sequences, but they do fold in a very similar way. So, although they're not literally identical, they are pseudo symmetric. And so that's a single sodium channel. And then on top of that, you have, as I said, the beta subunits binding. So, as far as we know, there's a one to one stoichiometry between the beta one and a sodium channel and the beta two and a sodium channel. However, the uh, super resolution imaging that I mentioned uh, uh, towards the end of the talk clearly shows that on the plasma membrane, these individual channels can form local clusters. And therefore, there must be some way of connecting them, at least in the context of, a, uh, 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 of, the, of the plasma membrane. Uh, but though that, that super organization is relatively weak and it doesn't usually survive breaking open the cell so that by the time you purify the sodium channels, they come down as a single polypeptide alpha subunit with associated one to one betas. Okay, so thank you. And uh, there's one more question from uh, Dr. Asima Bhastacharya. She's also in a panel. So she's asking that, uh, does the membrane micro environment be a factor in a beta subunit interaction with the rest of these subunits? And it's also, you know, I, I, uh, I also want to add one uh, question, which is related to that, that uh, what actually make this beta three subunit, uh, you know, to um, regulatory domain or regulatory subunit for this sodium channels? Sorry, say that again. Oh. How, how um, does the beta subunit work is, in other words? Yeah, I mean, uh, what it makes to, you know, regulatory for the whole sodium channel, you know, there are so many other so that, subunits also, beta yeah, one, beta two. That, yeah, yeah, sure, please. that's a really good question. And the honest answer is that we don't know, but we know that if we just look at the beta one as, a, as an example, we know that the Ig domain is important. So for example, if you chop off the Ig domain, then that shift that I mentioned in the V half of, acti of inactivation, that just, that goes away. So the presence of this beta subunit, some Ig domain somehow is influencing the voltage sensors on the channel. And it is quite s suspicious that they're sitting, it, this one is sitting right on top of the voltage sensor from this domain. We also know that these beta subunits are glycosylated. And in fact, there are some of the sugars which you can see in the cryo EM structure are pointing down towards the, uh, the region where the S4 helix is. We also know that these sugars are silylated at the tips, so they have sialic acids on them. And one idea is that the beta Ig domain is just a way of presenting sialic acids close enough to that voltage sensor, that S4 helix, that the local field that the helix detects is slightly different from the bulk field. And that's what's giving you these shifts. What it doesn't explain is the kinetic aspects. Why do you recover from inactivation faster and so on? And that I think is something to do with the intracellular domain. But unfortunately, the cryo EM structures that we've got so far have not resolved the intracellular regions of the betas and the, uh, and, and the uh, uh, 
alpha subunits. But that indeed is a very interesting question. And, but with, armed with these structures, we can now at least start to um, narrow things down and come up with more focused hypotheses. Oh, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. The other question was about the lipid environment, wasn't it? Yes, uh, it's, it was uh, about the membrane micro environment be a factor in beta subunit interactions with the rest of the yes. subunits. Yeah. That's yes, right. I mean the lipid micro environment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. Because it turns out, and I, I didn't have time to go into this, uh, but it turns out that there's a very interesting cysteine in the beta subunit transmembrane helix, and it's very close to where we think the border is between the intracell intracellular face and the membrane. And in fact, it fits the consensus uh, of um, a meristillation site. So it looks like this could be uh, meristillated. And uh, it is known that these do accumulate uh, in uh, lipid rafts, for example. We also know that the lipid composition of the membrane around the channel can indeed affect the gating behavior, right? Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's another layer of complexity, which I haven't got time to go into, but it's almost certainly the case that as well as these things are patching and forming these local patches, they're also localized in discrete lipid microenvironments on the membrane. And that actually might have effects on uh, the gating kinetics as well. So there's, if you think about it, there's lots of, basically nature has come up with lots and lots of different ways to fine tune these channels. For a start, there are 10 different alpha subunit genes, and each different alpha subunit is expressed in a tissue-specific fashion, and they have fairly obvious kinetic and gating differences, which are fine-tuned for the physiological roles. But layered on top of that, you have the beta subunits, which can interact with these alphas, and they fine-tune the gating back and forth. Then, indeed, the lipid environment, which could change them again. So by the time you've added all, multiplied all of those together, you've got quite a large number of different combinatorial ways to generate lots of different sodium channels with subtly different effects. Okay, thank you, Professor. So uh, just one more question here uh, from Pudeep Bose uh, from AIB. And uh, his question is that, uh, would like to, uh, he want to uh, know, is there any molecular link between arithmetic death or sleep disorder and ion channel remodeling. Between, sorry, they. Miss, is what? there any link, molecular link between arithmetic death? Um, arithmetic death, you know, and, or sleep disorders. That, uh, oh, is there uh, sleep disorders and ion channel remodeling oh, okay. has any relation um, or linkage? So, yeah, I don't know is the honest answer. Um, but um, there is a review. So, Ning Yang wrote this amazing review in which they, or, well, probably not her, but somebody in her lab, went through all the data bases and all the literature and literally catalogued every single mutation in every single alpha subunit known and the associated dis inherited diseases with them. So, uh, I could send you that reference and you could look through it. <laughs> but as, as far as I know, uh, these sleep disorders are not one of them, but, but they might be, yeah. I, I mean, that when I was at Stanford, they had this, um, they had this breed of dogs that had uh, these narcolepsy. And so when they got excited, they would literally just fall asleep. And uh, so they were using that as a way of finding the molecular basis of, of sleep. And, 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 but, and I know they did find it, and, but it wasn't an iron channel. It wasn't, certainly wasn't a sodium channel. Okay, so thank you. So, uh, as we have only one, I think we have a time for one last question. So, I take one question from uh, uh, Kirti Rani, and uh, he's asking that uh, that can the channel channelopathy lead to any inherited disease, or for this, which proteins are mainly responsible for either peripheral proteins or integral proteins or plasma of plasma membrane? So, yeah, so um, uh, as I mentioned, there are a number of inherited diseases associated with different sodium channels. Um, so the one I know best is Brigada syndrome, actually. These are the cardiopathologies. So there's a large number of inherited um, heart diseases 
Um, Brigada syndrome, there's another one called Long QT syndrome. There's another one called Six Sinus syndrome. And they all have varying characteristics, but a typical uh, effect with um, Brigada syndrome is that you get spontaneous arrhythmias. And often this can happen without warning. Sometimes it happens if the heart's stressed. So for example, if you're running, you can, it, will, it can trip the heart into these arrhythmias. There was a case uh, of a footballer uh, some years ago, and uh, he, um, he literally, he, he died halfway through a match because he just literally had a heart attack. And it was only after he died when they did a post-mortem that they I realized that he had Brigada syndrome. So this is actually quite a serious uh, uh, business. Now it turns out that there are hundreds of mutations in NAV1.5 which, which can potentially cause Brugada syndrome. And as in that reference I mentioned from Ning Yang's group, that they, they list them all. But interestingly, there are lots of other genes that, are, that can be mutated in Brugada syndrome. So there are a lot of patients with Brugada syndrome that have normal sodium channels and normal beta subunits. So clearly there are other things that are being broken which are interfering with the action potential of the heart. And some of these now have been identified as proteins which interact with the sodium channel. Okay, so for example, some of the calnexins, um, some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, uh, caviolin, caviolins uh, uh, bind uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to NAV 1.5. And there's a particular mutation in caviolin which causes a, a, a long QT type syndrome. And it, and it turns out it affects the binding to NAV1.5. And indeed, there's, a, there's an interesting problem because um, there, there, there's a so-called missing genes, right? So when people come up with these patients with Brigada syndrome, oftentimes they, find, they do all the standard tests for you know, NAV1.5 and beta and so on, and not un, uh, and quite often they find that these patients have normal sodium channels. And therefore this patient, which clearly has Brigada syndrome, there's something else wrong. And it's often not easy to spot what that other thing is. But there's a strong suspicion that it's in some other protein that is interacting with the sodium channel. Okay. So uh, I think I can take one uh, some more question here. So uh, as, uh, we have a few minutes. So uh, one question from uh, Sudeep. Uh, uh, yes. I think Manish. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, so I think we. Uh, Manish, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I think what we will do is let us discuss the research research points oh, okay, now. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we will. Be, so, uh, Mr. Jackson, I was fascinated by your sojourn start of the ion channel potential, how does the action potential is formed, how it is useful for neuromuscular conduction, and all the whole brain functions, nervous system function is based on this sodium, potassium, and the action potentials. So right from there, and they are taken up to the beta 3 subunit of uh, it's so uh, interesting that I wanted to know you have developed a very important method, the quantitative proximity proteomic method oh, yes. Yes. that can yes. be applied to complex. Yes. So I, I didn't clusters expand on this piece. This new quantity. I, um, yeah, I I didn't have time to go into that, and I thought I'd just focus on the sodium channels. But the other big thing that we are interested in is indeed proteomics to look at surface proteomes. Remember, I talked about the sodium channel in these clusters. We'd like to know what the molecules in the clusters are, and we have methods. We develop proteomic methods that allow us to label proteins in the vicinity of a target. Uh, we call it SPLAT, but other people have developed similar methods. 
Um, and we're you, we are actually using that to look at the neighbors of the sodium channel. But yeah, it's, um, I mean, I'm happy to, uh, to go to, to talk to you about it in more detail if you want. I mean, you know, I just, yeah, right. No, I think that's good enough. Now, one more comment I would like you to make on cancer because there's a lot of scientists working in Amity University, Amity Group uh, in cancer and they have formed a cancer. So we, I would like to know, how does this NAV upper regulation in cancer, we can use it as sources of cancer, a particular type of cancer that you can use this NAV upper regulation. So can you expand on this? How can you use it for the early diagnosis? So, because um, in the case of pheochromocytoma, the PG3 is not normally expressed in the surrounding normal tissue, but it looks like the individual pheochromocytomas are expressing beta 3 So for example, if you use that as a marker in histology, for example, you could, you could use that. Um, and we're, we're investigating that as a, as a plausible uh, possibility. We know, for example, that um, uh, to, to treat these pheochromocytomas, you, uh, you can remove them by surgery. It is often difficult to cut out literally all of the tumor. And uh, there are methods that you can use to use fluorescent tags. If you've got a good antibody to a tissue specific marker, you can use that as a guide. And so that's another possibility that we're looking into. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You can Sir, there's we a network issue actually. We cannot hear you well. I'm afraid, I, I find it's a bit difficult to hear. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, sir, actually, there's uh, some network issue with you. I think you're you not audible well with us. Uh, we are not able to hear you, sir. But, um, I mean, if you just email me, then, and, uh, you know, we could have a working further... These domains. And so we have assembled about four faculties who are really uh, uh, working close to your area. So Jack... Yeah, to Professor Jackson. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm afraid I, 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 it's difficult to hear you, I'm afraid. Uh, sir, I believe uh, Dr. Silva Murthy uh, is saying uh, that the panelists yes. here basically have. Uh, Am I audible now? Yes, sir, you are audible. Please, please okay. Dr. Yes. Jackson? Yes, yeah. yes, sir. Hi. So I, I'm afraid I could. I, I, didn't uh, get uh, okay. But I don't think anybody Manish, heard. Can you start with that uh, research work sure, that sure. you have in mind, Manish? Uh, Manish, uh, you can start uh, with that. You are Dr. You, Manish. Uh, you want to uh, start with the. So, Sure, sure. Um, so I will share the screen and the presentations yeah. okay. which have been uh, made by the panelists. Uh, then uh, we we'll all be able to see it. So. Yeah. Okay, okay, I okay. Uh, please go. So, uh, Professor Jackson, actually, here we are going to share with you, the, with you some of uh, our research works, uh, mm -hmm. basically uh, based on the membrane proteins and some other, uh, you know, some uh, uh, involve, involvement of the other membrane proteins mm -hmm. in and targeting some you know diseases or something else. So, we have here a panel of some uh, faculties okay. who is working on this area, and then uh, we'll talk to you, we'll discuss with you on this, and we'll. Uh, Look forward from you to yeah. if uh, we can have you know further uh, link with you or yeah. linkage or interaction. Yeah. Uh, Professor Jackson, Jackson, can I request you to please stop sharing your screen so that I can? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, so just can make, you make it. it uh, yes, slide. Just show it in slideshow. 
Yes, sir, I have uh, done that. So I would request uh, Dr. Manish to please uh, start. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, currently I'm working in the area of uh, biochemical, biophysical and structural analysis of uh, sodium proton antiporter, that is uh, NHA antiporter. And uh, here actually I'm working, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find, uh, find out uh, the crucial residues which are important for the ion transportation as well as pH regulation within the cells. As this antiporter actually very important for you know, maintaining the homeostasis within the, cell, within the cells by, uh, uh, by regulating the cell volume and all. So, uh, and also this, this study is very important as uh, the homologs of this protein is also present in humans which where this is called uh, sodium proton exchangers or sodium proton antiporters. So they are, they are involved in hypertension and some kidney diseases as well as heart diseases too. So somehow uh, after the studies on this uh, uh, bacterial cells uh, um, model, uh, we want to plan to, uh, we, were, we, uh, we are planning to uh, you know, implicate these outcomes and uh, studies on the human, uh, to, to target the human diseases somehow. So here uh, uh, we are, we are, uh, uh, we are doing um, uh, my group, or we are doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, site directed mutagenesis, and uh, on the particular, uh, you know, selected mut residues that have a proposed role in uh, binding as well as pH regulation, and then further somehow we actually predict how uh, uh, it means uh, how that particular residue has an important role for that particular purposes. So in that directions, uh, we are actually pursuing our work here. And uh, also as uh, you know, we are, we are we, before we had a discussion with you before also uh, in order to prepare some uh, proposal. So uh, as uh, uh, um, uh, we are in the process to propose, uh, uh, to make some uh, uh, project proposal with the professor at ejection right now with you. And uh, uh, that is basically would be based on a structure in investigation to reveal the two dimensional micromolecular organization. So here in order to get the you know, high resolution imaging or also we can plan to do a system scanning in order to find out the, some structural, uh, uh, you know, structural properties or even the functional properties of the you know, particular residues within the beta three subunits or maybe and how they are actually related with the sodium channel. So, okay. uh, we are working on it. Let us have the response from Jackson. Yes, sir. Yes. Please. Uh, Let please, us sir. have the response from Jackson. Just brief response. How do you feel this oh. possibility for a collaboration uh, presentation? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Oh, hang yeah. on. Yeah. You can hear me. Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, uh, I will actually, Manish and I have been in touch um, about the possibilities and um, there may be, uh, you said that there was a, a call in September or something. Yes, yes, yes. The, 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 the particular question that we're interested in, and I thought perhaps would be of interest to you, given your structural bi background, was indeed this issue about <coughs> how the channels themselves are arranged on the plasma membrane. I'm not entirely sure what the best way forward is this. I mean, we have actually uh, a collaborator at the University of Sussex who has access to atomic force microscopy. Whether that will work, I don't know. But there are, there are some structurally interesting things that we can look at, which I think would play to your strengths and would help us, uh, uh, and also address this whole issue about how the channels are localized on the membranes. Also, in the hex cell, of course, we're using that as a model system. But what we'd really like to do is to look in a real, new, a real cardiac cell, cardiomyocyte cell. And uh, we have uh, th those as well. We've got primary cells that we can use and also iPS cells uh, as well. So. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We can, uh, Thank we you can... so much, Jackson. Yeah, you can build up Manish, keep interacting with him and let us build a UKV project or some other collaborative project with him. Uh, best wishes. Can we move on to the next slide? Uh, this is from Dr. Pallavi Agarwal. Next slide. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, good evening, Nishin, everyone. Nishin. Good evening. Yes, sir, we are on the next slide. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Dr. Pallavi is an outstanding scientist. She is a Ramali Swami Fellow, the Institute of Molecular Medicine and Stem Cell Research. And uh, she is working on cancer. Over to you, Pallavi. Uh, what do you have? Your thoughts? 
yes thank uh, you thank, thank you so much sir thank you so much sir so uh, professor jackson actually i don't really work on ion channels on membrane proteins uh, but uh, i definitely have a lot of interest in cancer and cancer epigenetics and that interest actually was developed when i was doing uh, my post doctoral training with professor steve jackson at gordon institute and because he is a you know pioneer in dna damage and repair and i was interested in epigenetics so we wanted to combine those and what we showed actually that um, um, one of the epigenetic enzyme which is d9a it can potentiate the anti tumor activity of uh, chemotherapeutic agents uh, which are used for treating various cancers and from there i took forward and currently here as you can see here my research focus is quite multi dimensional uh, my main aim is so that uh, i can actually develop uh, some novel epigenetic based molecular therapeutics for ovarian and breast cancer targeting their pathogenesis and also the chemotherapy um, uh, chemo and radio resistance because in ovarian cancer we know that there is um, a relapse and recurrence because of the surge of stem cells and also because of the acquired uh, drug resistance and these are uh, major factors that lead to high mortality rate in ovarian cancers and uh, as you were also discussing and uh, i have also read in papers that um, the um, the alpha subunit of sodium channels are over expressed in metastatic ovarian cancer cells and i was wondering i mean the question that came to my mind was what is the contributing role of uh, sodium channels in cancer relapse and i think that is a pertinent question and that's something i would like to talk to you further later on yeah. i can yeah. thank you thank yeah. you dr palavi uh, thank you jackson uh, your immediate gut gut response gut pain yeah um the the that uh, as i mentioned very briefly i i i suspect that the sodium channels in the cancer cells are doing something quite different from what they would normally do in a heart or a neuron <clears throat> and uh, there are some interesting suggestions so uh, there's a guy called uh, Mustafa Damjog in London at Imperial College who who has done a lot more on this and Bill Brackenbury in Leeds as well and uh, so they have come up with an idea that the uh, the sodium channel can interact with the sodium proton translocator right and the idea is that the sodium channel is there to stabilize this sodium proton translocate so basically it's a way of the cell spitting out protons which would then acidify the local environment and we know that these so the, these cancer cells because they're a bit unbalanced they do tend to leak out their lysosomal enzymes and so one idea is that this is really a rather roundabout way of the cell um, activating their lysosomal enzymes in the extracellular matrix I am I'm not an expert on that I don't know if that's true but anyway that's one idea that has been suggested yeah thank you so much so, and yeah, i'll i'll get back to you on that yes yeah, yeah, yeah get in touch thank you yeah thank you thank you pallavi move on to the next to next presentation um, sir next the next uh, sir dr ashima i would request dr ashima to please uh, yeah introduce her Dr. Ashima Patakyaji is from Amity University, Calcutta. She is a Ramanujam fellow, and uh, uh, she is interested in membrane-bound intracellular copper transporters in pediatric onset disease. She has been working in that area, and uh, she has some thoughts to share with you. Over to you, Dr. Ashima Patakyaji. Thank you, Professor Selva Mutti, and uh, thank you, Professor Jackson, for a wonderful talk. and i would like to first introduce myself um i did my postdoctoral fellowship with professor svetlana lutsenko in the department of physiology at the johns hopkins university medical school as an independent pi uh, my current research is focused into understanding the role of cellular copper homeostasis in neuronal differentiation and the overall goal is to understand the etiology of neurodegeneration associated with copper metabolism disorders and these disorders are caused due to mutational inactivation of the p type copper atpases 
and uh, both copper deficiency and copper accumulation disorders involve neuronal symptoms which emphasizes the importance of this metal in the physiology of the neurons now apart from uh, this neuro uh, neurological symptoms uh, specifically copper accumulation disorders they involve hepatobiliary um, carcinoma therefore i'm also trying to uh, investigate how mu uh, mutish genetic mutations in this p type copper atpases affect their structure function and intracellular localization and also the molecular pathways that are triggered by excess intracellular copper towards hepatobiliary carcinoma uh, in the in case of copper uh, accumulation disorders so in this respect um, i'm looking for a collaboration where i could image um, metal this uh, specifically as i'm interested in copper if i could image this metal in either fixed or live cells and also i'm uh, at a much later phase i'm looking into doing some tissue imaging as well um i i i can ask around actually I, it, it it there is a now this is i'm trying to remember the details but i think there are ways of doing this um but to be honest i'm not entirely sure how you would do it but i could have a, a uh, ask around in Cambridge because I'm sure that there will be people who know how to do it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and so yeah, absolutely, I could I could dig around and. and, and yeah, sure. Then and I if, can. And, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. I would now request Dr. Prabhuda Gupta to. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you. Professor Selvamuthu and Professor Jackson. Actually, I am not a neuron guy. I, in my postdoc, I used to work on uh, myosin type one proteins. Thank you. And I had a drug called PCLP, and this drug used to affect the membrane cytoskeleton addition properties of this protein. It's a it's a membrane. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ashi. Hello. Huh. This is actually a membrane cytoskeleton glue, and we tried on both. Embryos, a bigger embryo like zebrafish and a smaller embryo like C. elegans. In zebrafish embryo, we see that if you can see from the figure that when you add this drug, it creates uh, ruffles in the membrane and the actin layer. And most in interestingly, we found that the lipid droplets, which is supposed to form the cell cell junction, is going and accumulating at the cell cell junction like a clump. So this was the observation, but it, it is nothing to do with them. Uh, with uh, but can you go to the please next go. slide, please? Next slide. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So myosin one has uh, nothing to do with uh, uh, channel other than in the stereocochlea in the ear where it maintains the tension. But my uh, uh, point of uh, study has shifted from there, and now I am looking on the structure function analysis of putative host lipid transporter protein in m lepre why i shifted because when m lepre attacks nerve it forms a lot of lipid granules and from there it pulls the lipid on inside itself it is the same thing happen in tuberculosis when it affects the lungs then their foamy macrophages form and their protein a fatty 13 is known and crystal structure is also solved for mycobacterium tuberculosis that pulls the Lipid inside the inside the bacterial cell, but fatty thirteen okay. homolog is absent in lepre. We have some uh, we have some uh, nearby homology twilight region proteins shortlisted. We are going to clone, isolate, purify, and crystallize. And I want somebody who can guide me to help in membrane associated protein crystallization techniques and structure solvation. This is the first goal. This project has been submitted to Royal Society of Tropical Medicine. It has been shortlisted as fundable. Hopefully they will fund me. They are telling there is very less fund available this year. And after that, after I get handled in this project, I want to work on the <coughs> getting uh, uh, the, the, the ion channels and what is the effect of ion channels in leprosy. How the painless channel of uh, painless uh, behavior of leprosy associated neurons we see is it solely due to demyelination 
or some channel of athletes are also involved. But that is my second goal. After I want to get hands on in the lipid portion, then I want to move into the channel portion. And that is thank you. That is all for my side. Can I just ask a quick question then? Um, the, the, the leprosy is one of the side effects is that you lose your sense of pain, right? Mm -hmm. And that presumably is why you get all of these mm -hmm. complications with with leprosy. Do we know what what's going on there? Is there um is there a selective destruction of the pain fibers? Or I know I don't know anything uh, about that. The present hypothesis goes through demyelination of the axon. Demyelination, okay. But I don't know whether that is the sole cause or whether we can reverse this by playing around or tweaking the ion channels. That, but again, that is the second portion. First, I want to solve the structure of the, of the lipid transporter. And I, I want somebody to help me out because I have never done, a, I have done FTSD protein structure in my PhD, but never a membrane associated protein. Yeah. Um... I could. Um, I, uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I could. I think I know some people who work on memory, but uh, not these, not this one. Um, yeah, okay, I could have a have a look round and see, but I can't promise you anything. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the next slide is by uh, Dr. Ayan Rai Chaudhary. Good afternoon, everybody. I thank all the dignitaries who are present here, including Professor Selvamurthy and especially Professor A.P. Jackson. I am working with plant vacuolar ATP bonding cassette, which is known as ABC transporter. And earlier it was known as multiple resistant protein, MRP. So it's a plasma membrane or vacuolar membrane bound transporter protein, which sequestered many xenobiotics and heavy metals. And Arabidopsis thaliana, ABCC1 contains two nucleotide binding domains, NBD and two transmembrane domains. Earlier in my work, I found a serine triad is present just before the second NBD2 domain. And among them, you can present the last slide. is getting phosphorylated in presence of arsenic stress and helping in transport and sequestration. We check this by preparation of different mutants and the work was done in East and Arabidopsis tDNA mutants. For phytoremediation strategies in metalloid polluted areas, specific transporter proteins are the key components for both accumulation and detoxification of metalloids. ABCC1 in yeast cell show enhanced tolerance in presence of heavy metals. ABCC1 enhanced arsenic tolerance and accumulation in vacuoles. Uh, and also that, that, the phospho ABCC1 in presence of heavy metal stress may be involved in different transport signaling. And for my future work, I have an interest. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ryan. Thank you. Yes. yes, sir. No, sir. I, uh, thank I, you. Now he has got the point. Thank you, sir. Uh, keep interacting with. Uh, keep, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, keep interacting with him, Dr. Yes. Jackson. Yes. Uh, now, uh, thank you so much for your uh, patience. Now, can we see Professor Jackson on the screen? Yes. So 
actually i yeah, have very... a future interest no, i am that yes sir yes sir no, we will discuss that later you you can just discuss with professor jackson later and mishi just switch off the yes sir uh, the other screen i thank uh, you very much for this very useful interaction i have just selected a few people who are in this in your domain as well as close to the membrane uh, the kinetics thank you sir study so that is why i thought i want to now keep professor jackson and build uh, build the further future collaboration uh, professor jackson yeah are you there yeah can you can you see me can you hear me professor jackson yeah can you see me can yeah, you hear yeah, me yeah 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 okay so, good right yeah yeah we can see you <laughs> and now the we also have dr ashok chohan the founder president Yeah, I would request him to give some concluding remarks. We have a lot of things to uh, talk to you, discuss with you. We have just begun the collaboration discussions. We will take it forward, and we have a campus in London. Uh, All right. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. Okay. Good. London. We, yeah, we have a campus. Thank you. That's. been uh, it's been so, very interesting and uh, uh, i really enjoyed certainly they will also come and visit you and they will interact with you and yeah. i invite you to come to our campus not only in london but also oh sure right. that'd be great uh, remarks yeah thank you for okay. the president sir um, probably the best thing is manish because there are so many people have been so far, talking i've been, I've been sir, uh, trying to have to have uh, to leave because uh, he he has another uh, conference to attend right so he's not here at that was the message i got okay um probably the best thing because I've, i've been writing down everybody's eight but probably manish if you could um ask uh, everybody that you know wants to talk and everyone that's talked to me and everybody that has any more questions just um, you know drop me an email okay and i will um, i will answer them all <laughs> sure 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 all right thank you yeah good so uh, i look forward so yeah i managed we should have a long uh, chat about and uh, now so we, we look we look forward to work with you professor jackson and uh, and Uh, thank, thank you very much thank you a Jackson, lot for, for this wonderful this webinar you have given us that's so much uh, you can give the vote of thanks yeah uh so professor jackson thanks a, thanks a lot for the wonderful uh, talk on sodium channels it was a really uh, enlightening experience for all of us and uh, we hope that this doesn't end here and we take it forward uh, to either one of the panelists here or to mothers who are listening to you and there have been lots of messages the messages lots of questions also i think we all these will be put forth to you through emails and uh, we would and we really thank you for your for gracing this occasion for us and uh, being present and we and i take this opportunity to thank our uh, honorable founder president our honorable chancellor of amit university noida and uh, honorable chancellor of amit university haryana and uh, pro, uh, dr selva murthy of course and dr Nara, professor narayan rishi and uh, for making this uh, possible and we hope this is the, we hope uh, the global network of uh, global network for research on uh, novel viruses uh, will continue to flourish uh, by bringing more uh, renowned scientists uh, into the into the forum and uh, we hope our students and scholars are all equally benefited from this and uh, we hope to take this forward to make science a better place in, in the post covid era thank you thank you. thank you thank you very much thank you all, okay. all the viewers and thanks for joining thank you and have thank a you professor jackson thank you so much sir thank you it was nice talking to you thank you, thank you. see you again thank you sir bye, bye.